welcome to the Read Local Show presented by Lit Carnival and me, your host, Toy Thomas, author, blogger, and reading advocate. I'm so excited to share today's guest with you. Miko Marsh focuses on faith and self-transformation. Let's meet Miko Marsh. All right. All right. I'm so glad to have you here today, Miko. How are you doing? I am well. Thank you for asking. Nice, <laughs> nice, bright day. It's warm. It's not raining. Oh, I know. Yeah. This it's like it's yesterday was the first day of spring and it, you know, it feels pretty good. So that's awesome. <laughs> Go ahead and tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, my name is Miko Marsh. Um, under Miko, I primarily write nonfiction and children's stories. Uh, I also write poetry and contemporary fiction under Abelia Akanke. Um, I've been writing for a while. So in addition to writing, um, I'm getting ready to retire from childcare. Uh, I'm an audio describer for blind and visually impaired patrons. And I'm also a marketing and revisions editor with New Degree Press. So I try to help other people get their book babies out. That's awesome. I love to see um, a resume like that because it shows that you have many, not only many different interests, but many different skills and you're out there helping other people. And I think that's great. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's, that's kind of my, uh, pretty much why I do what I do. Um, when I put things out, it's, I want to grab that opportunity to, to give something back either to teach, to put a lesson in, or, you know, to share what I've learned. They may not necessarily agree with it, but this is what I've gotten so far. If it helps you, great. If it doesn't, well, <laughs> you know, just take it with a grain of salt and maybe it can help you the next time. I, I love, I love that mentality. I think I too try to help people. Um, again, like you said, if, if it helps, great. If not, you take it with a grain of salt. I, I like that. <laughs> All right, so I want to get into the first segment of my interview um, process. I start with what's called the open book, and this is where we kind of get to know you as a reader um, or whether or not you are a reader. So my question for you today is, is this the case now or has there ever been a time where you didn't really enjoy reading? Yes, uh, and I have periods of time where that comes and goes. Um, I am probably in that area now. I enjoy reading for my authors right now because I'm reading and I'm learning about them in the process of, of uh, working with their books. But I do a lot of audio. So I listen to audiobooks and seminars and workshops. So there's a lot of uh, you know, to listen and then to write it down. And with, uh, because I do a lot of, I read a lot of articles. Mm -hmm. uh, I read a lot of nonfiction. <laughs> I read a lot of nonfiction and uh, self-help things dealing with caregiving, uh, social services, because that's also where my, um, my degree is originally in psychology and minor in counseling. So we'll deal with uh, things that affect other people and how to better interact with them. So I, I read a lot of improvement. So it's not necessarily one book topic. There are sections that might be in it. So that's what I pick up on a lot of times right now. Okay. I, I know that I personally have, you know, struggled with reading a lot of nonfiction. Um, I actually am doing a reading challenge this year to help me, you know, read something nonfiction every month because I'm, I, I predominantly read fiction. So I do find that when I do get out of my comfort zone and read those books that help me in some way, I like it. I don't know why I resist it so much. <laughs> I actually started uh, attending book clubs this year so the last thing i read i actually enjoyed it it was but it was a play it okay. was fences by august wilson and uh, it's it's actually nice to sit and listen to other readers mm -hmm. to hear what they're 
to hear how they're interpreting things. Mm -hmm. Um, And because it's not work. So that's, that's kind of a challenge uh, to, to participate with the group where they're saying, we're going to read this specific book this month and to look at it like, okay, so this doesn't necessarily relate to me at all. Uh, but it's, it's nice to have that break. And I think for so long, I've had reading attached with work that going back to the time when I was in fourth and fifth grade, where I was just reading to be reading like Harriet the Spy or, you know, trying to solve a mystery with Nancy Drew or, you know, <laughs> figuring out how I was going to have my own babysitter's club, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, something like that. Getting back to that is, is a learning process for me, actually. It's funny. I, I went through that process and, and I think it's different for everybody. For me, it was when I went into college because I had so much required reading in college. I stopped reading altogether after I got my degree. I was just like, no, I'm not picking up anything and reading it. <laughs> but I eventually came back around. I, I was just like, I used to enjoy reading. I probably still do. And so I think that's when I really started diving heavily into fiction because I began to read for pleasure and I lost sight of expanding myself for a while, but I'm getting back into the nonfiction, but it is a process. Sometimes I do think when you do have to read a lot for work or school or something like that, you sometimes forget that you can um, read for something that's not work related. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I appreciate um, your children's collection too. I'm looking at that because, you know, as a childcare provider, these things make me super happy. Oh, good. <laughs> and I, I have, I'm doing overnight childcare right now. And little guy, when he shows up, it's not even, hi, Miss Miko, how you doing? It's, can we hear a story? Oh. So what I do is I put on an audio book for him so that he, you know, just to hear different voices and how the, the inflections and things like that. And then even if we're watching something, I'll have the subtitles on mm-hmm. so that, you know, he's listening and reading at the same time because, you know, I don't want to create reluctant readers or put them on the spot. But at the same time, I want to provide that rich learning experience. And that's been something that's been on my mind since this literacy panel a couple of weeks ago. It was, you know, how do we involve everybody without you know, making them feel like, okay, because I'm not reading this material, I'm not really a reader, or because I'm not doing it like you do, then it doesn't count anymore. You know, and I'm like, if we're, if our goal is to, you know, get them reading, then we want to provide a variety of things for them to have access to, and give them the opportunity to have choices. You know, if, if at one point you weren't allowed to read, but now you do, don't get mad at other people because they choose not to at this point. It's about the choice. Right. So. See, I, everything that you're saying right now, Miko, I am, I am so glad we're having this conversation <laughs> because I recently within the past year or two started calling myself a reading advocate. And so that's like really what I'm trying to hit home right now. And what you were just saying is one of the things that I am explaining to people is to kind of break down these societal norms that say you have to read certain things. Like you said, if we're trying to get kids to read, don't make them read, you know, certain things if they're interested in reading something else. And I think I I love the idea of meeting the kids where they are, especially if, like you said, if you do have a reluctant reader, giving them something in audio form and letting them fall in love with that that will encourage them to want to be able to read it on their own later. That's actually why like some of the children's books that I have, I have them for free, like on YouTube where I read them out loud and everything. And um, I meant, I, I mean, keep meaning to do the others, but that's beside the point. My point I know is, the feeling. It's like, yeah. Cause you have a lot of stuff coming up and your heart is in the right place. Right. Just, <laughs> it's like the timing was off. The timing right. Was off. But no, I totally am for getting people to read where they are. So if that means, you know, giving them images to help them read it, then do that. Or providing the audio, then do that. But I just, I love the idea of encouraging people to read what they want to read and 
I just, I think it does make it more appealing if it's not like you have to read this, you know? Yes. All right. So I feel, <laughs> feel like we've kind of um, gone to town on the whole reading thing. <laughs> so let's um, switch gears just a little bit. Um, I want to get into what I call the open book. And this is where we get to talk about you as a writer. And so you've already mentioned that you have a pen name and you kind of explained the difference between, you know, when you publish as Miko, you're doing like nonfiction and children's things. And then with, um, pronounce your pen name again? Obelia. Obelia. So as Obelia, you were doing poetry and you said light fiction? Uh, contemporary fiction. A lot of it's family friendly. Okay. That tends to be women's fiction. So how did you like come up with you know deciding to split these two parts of of your writing and how did you come up with your pen name okay well the pen name was a spinoff of uh I used to go to a legal board and we would discuss uh, family law things up there um but sometimes it would get a little heated so one of the ladies created a spinoff so that we could take all of our arguments over there. And I, I came up with the name Abelia that because Abelia is Greek for a pillar of strength, because sometimes I'm saying hard things. I'm saying things that people don't necessarily want to confront, but I have to put it in this form because I don't think you got the point when I was trying to be nice. Right. Um, there was a middle name, but I don't remember what it was. It was Hawaiian and it was, it was pretty, but I don't think... I was like, I couldn't remember what it was. I don't know why I gave it a middle. But Akanke is Nigerian for to know her is to love her. Because if I am saying these things, typically I'm not trying to be malicious. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am doing it because I feel it needs to be said. But it's because I care enough to share that information with you. So I used that when I started performing in Japan. Um, I don't think I did it beforehand, but I, I know I performed like that in Japan. And several years later, I was still I was still using that name, but people were recognizing me from Mobilia. So they remembered my poems that way. So right. when I started writing, I mean, I put out a couple of things in 2013, didn't think of it again until I started again in 2017. And it was, uh, how do I what do I do with this? People remember me from like all these years ago with this. So I just kept poetry and fiction with Obelia and nonfiction. I figured I'd use my name because it's nonfiction. Right. <laughs> you know? and, and I was always already providing childcare. You know, so when I started putting out childcare topics, it was just easier to say, hey, you know, and to point that to parents. Uh, and they typically have different, different purposes. Uh, with Miko, I tend to write, uh, because I ran a, uh, a home-based Christian child care, and I do a lot of uh, Bible study topics. So in this, I tend to deal with self-help, self-transformation, Christian-related topics, child care-related topics, and because working with children, it just kind of spun off into children's children's books. And because I operated a business, I, I was talking about business things. With Obelia, I am leaning more towards the social services side. So I tend to draw a lot from my direct care experience where I worked in behavioral health settings. So I've worked with people who've had disabilities. I've worked in homicidal, suicidal units. Um, so I'm that person that's running up and down the hallway trying to keep people from having an opportunity to kill themselves or their roommates or nurses, <laughs> you know, and yeah. we're, just, we're just talking with them, observing the behaviors and things. But that's also the side where I tend to talk about uh, anything that amuses me to uh, male sexual abuse or teen suicide. I'm dealing with things that we know are out there, but either we don't necessarily talk about it or a lot of people have a preconceived idea about what should be happening. So when I'm 
um, dealing with things with abuse, you know, you hear those questions like, why didn't you get out earlier? So right. if I'm writing from the perspective of an emotionally abused wife, you can see where my head is and what I'm thinking. So I'm hoping that when people read things like this, and they're not always heavy, but they're, they're meant to put a, a lesson in there just so you understand and have a little bit more compassion and that you're, you're a little bit willing to extend people a little bit more grace because you want to say what you would do in that situation. But when you've been dealing with something for several years, it's hard to think outside of the situation that you're already in. Wow, I, 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 uh, I can relate to that in some ways. Some ways I can't, but I still, I guess, am like inspired by it. Um, you know, having those two different personas, you know, you are who you are, you do, the, that's why it's nonfiction. And then having this other persona that allows you to dig a little bit deeper and explore some things, um, like you say, um, not necessarily being nice about it, but um, I, yeah, I, I, have a, I, I have a couple that are <laughs> that way. Well, no, I mean, I, I get that. Um, I've, you know, toyed with the process of the possibility of introducing another tip of pen name. I have one, um, but um, because I do think sometimes you have to have that separation. But then again, sometimes um, every every person is different. So um, if, if you're the kind of person who, who everything is perfectly in line, then you don't need that. But sometimes from a reader's point of view, I think it's good. It, it gives them the confidence in making a choice. You know, if I want to read something that I know is going to be more self-help, I'm, I'm going to read something from Miko. If I want to read something that I, you know, think is going to be a little bit more challenging, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to read something from Mobilia. So I, I like that. And it, it was a challenge, actually, because, you know, we th we go through those debates. Am I going to use this extra name? Are you going to know me? <laughs> Am I going to use like a picture? <laughs> How quiet do I want this to be? Right. You know, and I, I was concerned because I feel like people who meet me as Obelia don't have a problem with me as a writer as Miko. But sometimes people who come in and meet me as Miko are kind of thrown off when they read stuff from a billion. And one of the things I have to explain is that when you are working in these situations or you're the recipient of the vitriol that people are spitting out and venom, they're not using nice words. Right. They are coming at you to attack you. And in order for you to have that, to, to be close enough to the experience to understand what I'm putting in the story. I have to put you in that moment where you're like, I can't believe you said that to me. Right. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's some of the grace that comes with those pen names. Um, whether, whether you, you know, distance yourself from them or whether you say, you know, everybody knows it's you, I still think it provides a little bit of distance that says, they kept, that I think, again, that helps the reader understand well, I understand why she's doing this. So um, I like that. Um, the other question that I have for you is, um, I have seen your catalog of work. It, it is, ooh, girl, <laughs> how many titles exactly do you have? Do you know how many you have? I have 20. Wow, um, very individual. Nice. Very nice. And I'm in a couple of anthologies as Obelia. I haven't put the, the only thing I haven't put out yet is, a, uh, is poetry. So that is my personal challenge because I have been saying it for 17 years. That was when I first copyrighted my first collection of poems. Uh, so I plan to have that done by the end of this year. Nice. Looking forward to that. <laughs> yes, I'm like. I'm going to get a little collage like you. <laughs> so I don't like these collages. Well, people do sometimes will say, oh, I can't believe you've written so many books, but quite a few of them are picture books. So, um, But it's, it's, that's still, a, that's, still a, 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 that's still a work. You know, yeah. that's still a work of heart, as one of my little authors, my authors call it. You know, uh, because we're starting them at all ages. All ages need something. Exactly. I love it. All right. So now I want to move into the segment that I call a book signing. And this is where we get to talk specifically about some of your books. 
Now, I know um, I'm going to be putting some images up on the screen. Considering the extensive catalog that you have, the question that I want to know is we're focusing a little bit on this title, You Don't Want Success Today. Why did you choose to focus on that one? That one, I think, is challenging, but helpful to most people on, on various levels. Although it's geared to maybe the person who is feeling like they want to move up in their career mm -hmm. or in what they're doing, it, it can be used from anyone who wants to create the next social media app to the person who wants to go back and get his GED. Okay. And this one took me the longest time to complete. I think I spent about 18 months off and on working on it and it usually doesn't take me that long. But in it, all of, all of the topics were a challenge to me. So I shared those with others. Uh, it's broken into four, four sections, the topical chapters. So you have the subject matter, which could be facing other people's opinions, dealing with loss of income or trying to get more income, um, feeling like you don't have any support or even like you got set back, like you were on top and then like the bottom fell out and now you have to start completely over or you're doing it on your own. Uh, the second section is a Miko moment. So I'm telling you what I did and what I learned in the process. The third section is an interview with a professional. So I have taken or I have spoken with nine people. The 10th person contributed a poem. Okay. So I have nine people that I interviewed and they range in topics from finance to fine arts. Okay. And they're given tips that they used to help their career and they're helping us. And some of them have included their contact information. So if you want to follow up with them, say you want to talk about your investment portfolio or you want to find out more about human resources, they have ways that you can, you can follow up with them. And the fourth one is a section where you can fill in blanks and you can answer questions. Uh, when I was creating the concept, somebody has suggested that I create a book and then create a workbook and such and such. And I was like, I could, I mean, I, but if I was the reader, I would want both at once. Yeah. You know, I don't want, I don't want to buy a book and go buy a workbook and go buy all these other things. So I am always, I'm always trying to condense it and try to give you the max without breaking the, breaking the bank or hurting myself in the process. But I thought of what I would want as a reader and I would want to be able to write in and work on something and have somebody give me something now, because, you know, when I ask people about who they picture as being successful, a lot of times they're thinking like Oprah and Bill Gates. And I'm like, will you not be happy until you hit billionaire status? Do you know any billionaires? You know, it's like, do you actually need to hit that height? And most people don't. Most right. people don't need that much money or that kind of fame. They just want to be comfortable. They want to get where they can pay all the bills, do what they need to do, and feel like they've accomplished the goals that they've had. So it's easier to reach people who have done that here and then say, hey, you know, they're just like you. They're just like me. You know, these are things that we have done in order to hit these targets. So you can do that too. So I wanted to bring it a little bit closer to something that people could relate to. So that's how that came about. Well, I, I, I like I like the idea that you shot down the idea of having the book and the workbook. I like that you put it together. Um, whenever I do, um, you know, read some type of um, book that's meant to help improve my life, 
and then there's no practical application to it. I always feel like I've been kind of robbed a bit. <laughs> so your book seems like it has the inspiration, the motivation, it has the examples, and then the practical application. And that sounds perfect to me. <laughs> <laughs> so like I get I get a lot of flack sometimes for it because the books are like uh I mean it's it's really weird the way some some publishers won't let you put some things out just because of I'm like this this isn't a, a this isn't like a drawing book or you know like one of the activities it's primarily information it's just I have some note space in here for you just in here on this page yeah which that actually brings me to my next question. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about your publishing journey. I, I think nowadays, even traditionally published authors are also self-publishing um, because they have like side projects or interests and things like that. I do think there are some people who stick with one or the other. And so I wanted to talk about, you know, what is your um, stance on that? Are you dabbling in both? Are you doing one or the other and why? I prefer self-publishing and it's, I've actually never attempted to traditionally publish because I am in so many genres. I, I have my moments where I feel like writing poetry, which is right now. Mm -hmm. And then I change my mind. I feel like writing nonfiction. And when I put things out, when I'm writing things, sometimes I feel like I'm on a time limit which I mean, technically I am with life and everything, right. but I, there are times that I feel like I don't want to wait up to two years in order to put something out, which a lot of times that is the time span from conception of an idea to publication with a traditionally published book because they're doing the marketing and things. And I tend to think in terms of If I leave now, if I go at this point, will the information get out? I, I, I had that a lot of times when I was putting up blogs for the study blogs. Um, kind of like, I don't want to die and take this with me. I don't want to take all of my ideas to the grave. You know, gotcha. uh, that's actually part of how this Stop Surviving and Live came about, I, I got to the point where I, I was fatigued and it took me like 15 minutes to go from one side of the room to the other. And I was, I was on crutches periodically. And I was like, the only thing I can do right now is write and talk, <laughs> you know? So that's what I'm going to do. And with, with publishing, it's let me go ahead and put this information out and I'll go put it in that next project. I am bad about marketing. <laughs> I'm working on that more this year, but I have also done hybrid pub publishing, which is one of the things that I do with New Degree Press. Um, I have what the difference between hybrid and because th there's four main, you got traditional, where they do everything for you, you still have to help market, but they're fronting you, right? Usually, uh, the cost of publishing and maybe, maybe even in advance. Self publishing, it's all on you. You have your vanity publishers. There are a lot of people that are out there as self publishing and uh, problematic, but they're pretty much they're they're making the money. And then you're kind of stuck and you're still not able to make money even after they say you can sell books. And then there's hybrid publishing where you have either somebody who helps you put it together as a la carte, like mm -hmm. maybe they can provide editing services, maybe they can format it for you. Ours is in-house where you come in and we provide all of the services from developmental editing all the way up to proofreading with cover art and everything else. Uh, so I have used hybrid publishing for anthologies cool. when I was with Authors of Main Street. So two of my books came out 2019 and 2020. They were part of the Christmas Cookies on Main Street 
and Heroes on Main Street anthologies. I have since asked to be removed from it because all of my books are, are most of my books are wide and those are KU only. And I didn't want to distribute my portion of the books or give them away or try to be here and then potentially get somebody else in trouble. So I'm like, y'all go ahead and stay in KU. Let me come out and I will distribute here. So I feel like there was something else I was supposed to say there. But no, I mean, you, you covered quite a bit. Um, you know, it's funny that you mentioned right at the end, you know, um, getting, well, ha wanting to be pulled from those anthologies, you know, because you're wide. Um, I, when I had started out, I was publishing wide and then um, for a while my focus shift and I went exclusive for a number of years just because it was easier. And I'm since in the past, I would say year or so, then slowly um, going back through the process of publishing wide again, because it, it takes time. If you are in that exclusive contract, you have to wait for the contract to run out. Then you have to, you know, work on redistribution and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm going That's usually through when you get people that don't have KU or they they can't purchase to. And for people who are asking, it's, it's Amazon exclusive. Uh, yeah. Kindle Unlimited. Yeah. Uh, but I had people who couldn't, because of where they were located in the world, they couldn't purchase something from Amazon. And I was like, really? <laughs> you know, I didn't know that was possible. That's what I mean, happened guess, with me. You know, like, you know, so I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to give them a book because that violated the terms of the digital distribution. Like I wasn't allowed to pass them one for free and they couldn't read, like, I, my hands were tied. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's how, that's what basically happened with me. Um, I had come across someone and it was, again, they weren't able to access, you know, the book. And I, I personally, for me, I was shocked that I had readers that were outside of the country. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> what you can't get a book I will send it to you, you know, but, <laughs> right. um so yeah that's what prompted me to start the process but um no I love how you explained you know your thought process with doing the self-publishing um I myself prefer self-publishing um I have done some traditional publishing in the past didn't like it um I do still now submit for like anthologies and articles and things like that um I don't do what a lot of what's kind of popular right now where people post like their rejections. Um, if I get a rejection, it, it's right out of my mind. I don't think about it um, <laughs> because I just know it's part of the process. But mm -hmm. I also know, like you said, for me, that there are certain things that I want to get the information out and I'm not even going to bother with submitting for that because I know I, for me, it's more important to get it out there than to go through the process of traditional public publishing. So yes, I can relate to that. All right, so my next question is, um, I don't know if this is going to be a fun question or not. I find that when no, I, no. Well, no, 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 it's just that I find <laughs> that when I ask this kind of question, authors are always like, man, why'd you have to ask me that? <laughs> so it's not a bad question, I promise. <laughs> all right, so the question is, of your all of your catalog, aside from the book that we, we just talked about, You Don't Want Success, what is the one book that you recommend people read of yours? Like, what is the book, if, if, they, if you could only give them one book of yours to read, what book do you recommend people read of yours? Living with Jezebel. Okay. And, and you know, I have fun things. Living with Jezebel is not a fun book. Um, it's an informative book. But that's the one that, I actually had several years of uh, learning put into it, even though I didn't know I was going to write that book. It didn't start off as a book. It started off as a personal study. Living with Jezebel is the title. It's an, and the subtitle is An In-Depth Look at the Queen of Narcissism, Her Tactics, and Three Generations of Destruction. What it does is it takes a chronological view of the biblical queen Jezebel and the account of what happened from the time she entered 
until her great grandson. And I explained why I believe she was a narcissist, uh, that she was fully aware of what she was doing, the damage she caused to all of the people involved, how they reacted, and how we should be dealing with them, or at least uh, not necessarily you know, trying to confront them. Cause I know a lot of people are like, we're going to cast out this or we're going to go fight these. I'm like, uh, you might not need, <laughs> need to go through all of them. You might just block them. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it could be just as simple as blocking them, right. but what it, the purpose of it is to give people an idea of what narcissism is what it, what it is, what people who are fully committed to themselves can do. Um, when you are the recipient, when you're on the receiving end of this toxic, you know, toxic is now the big thing, toxic and narcissism and, you know, this, uh, when you're on the receiving end of that and trying to explain to people what is going on with gaslighting, where they're crazy making, they're saying things. Uh, a lot of times people can't see it. Narcissists tend to be charming. Some of them can be really intelligent. They know how to tell you what you want to hear. So uh, one of the, I guess she was a therapist online. She, she has something called dog, dog whistling. So, you know, with, when you blow a, a dog whistle, it's a frequency dogs can hear, people can't hear it. Right. And she used an example of sitting at a dinner table where maybe you and your spouse had been arguing about something. And it's been a source of contention for weeks. And you're at the dinner table and he's saying things to you to get you riled up. Nobody else understands what's going on, but he's now hitting these triggers and he's saying these things and then you blow up and now everybody's staring at you wondering why you went off because they don't know what's going on, but he's effectively blowing this dog whistle and now you're hearing it and you're like, y'all don't get it, but we don't get it because we're not aware that he's been playing these games this whole time. It's also to you know shed light on the fact that Narcissists can be female also, it can be male. It, it's anybody who understands that whole manipulation, um, how, how to do this. And there are some who are super dangerous. You know, um, then you have ones that are just high profile. They know how to play the game, like the Tindler swindler. You know, that's somebody who is on a high level of manipulation, getting people, you know, to give up like six figures to him to finance his lifestyle or, you know, Dahlia DiPolito, who was uh, a high profile murder case right. or attempted murder case, you know, so they're, they're out there, but they could be like right beside, just, just understanding uh, things to watch out for. I know that was super long. Sorry. No, <laughs> I was like, mean, I'm really passionate about this one. But that's good. That's, that was the question. So that's the book that, all right. Um, I don't believe I own that when I own some of your other, I'm, but I may have to get that one now because I didn't know. I mean, I knew what it was about, but hearing you describe it now, I get it now. So, all right. Because yeah, what I wanted to do was since a lot of people aren't familiar with that, that part of the Bible, like I have, uh, I have tables to help you along, including, you know, family tree, because there are names that come up, but I, sh I, I talk about what she did and then I follow up with examples of how you might see it played out in today's society. So each time I mention something she did and what was problematic at that time, I give you like a 21st century version of how, how that might come along because right. most of us aren't dealing with queens or princesses right. or <laughs> royalty. So right. we're not really dealing with somebody who has the, the ability to send an army after us. Right. I like that. Very nice. Definitely gonna have to check that out. 
All right, so now we're gonna move into the last section of this interview. This is what I call the silly section. <laughs> this is don't judge a book's by cover because you never know what the questions are gonna be. You never know what the answers are gonna be. And it's just meant to be a little bit fun. Pop quiz. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so the first question is, um, is there a talent or a skill you've tried to master, but just realize is not meant for you? And I'll just go ahead and tell you that mine is singing um it does there's i know everybody says it's one of those things that you can learn but if you're tone deaf you can't learn that so <laughs> for you what would that be i can't draw even with the straight line there um i i have a hard time with art i have a hard time with anything artist like i know what i want but i can't particularly anything dealing with geometry and art just trying to figure out how the things go together i can't i can't wrap my head head around placement so all right um who here would like to volunteer to help me <laughs> have you ever had like art or drawing lessons or anything like that i did a couple things off the off videos and i was like yay i did I did, I did the little face and things, but it, it doesn't stick. Gotcha. And I was the one that when given the option between art and music, I went to music, which is why I can, I can write you a song. I can sing some stuff along with it. I'll play the piano, but you want me to do like, I don't like to feel a construction paper. I don't write <laughs> with pencils. If I don't have to, I, I did, I took my math notes and pen, wow. you know, and they were like, are you sure? Hey, I'm, I'm certain it, if it's wrong, I just cross it out, but I'm pretty sure it's right you know, because I don't want to mess it up. Nice. I want my paper to look nice. <laughs> well, I, I like that. <laughs> I couldn't even imagine trying to take notes and pen. I, that would, oh my goodness. That's terrifying to me. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's different, but I, that's what I, I love to like that, that. I think that's so cool to learn that about you. <laughs> okay. So this next one is kind of a fun one too. <laughs> so she's already it, laughing <laughs> because I'm thinking about my like I know like me. So when it comes to visual media, let's say streaming does not exist. This is before the time of streaming. It never will exist. What do you prefer, Blu-ray, DVD, VHS, Beta, or film? I'm gonna go with DVD, even though it scratches. I've never had a Blu-ray, which is always frustrating when I go to the library and I check out something and I think, because I've seen the little disc, I'd get it home and it won't play. And it says Blu-ray, I was like, oh, I have a DVD. Uh, but my heart has been hurt so many times from the sound of a tape getting stuck in a cassette player or a VHS player. And then to have, it's playing like, I was like, oh, no, stop, stop, make it stop. And then, you know, you have to pull it out all super careful so it doesn't snatch and break. And then you're sitting here trying to twist it back so that it winds back up. And then every time it plays over that part is warped and it just hurts my heart. It just hurts my heart. <laughs> So. I, I feel you on that because when I was thinking about this, my immediate answer was VHS. But then I was like, man, you have to be so like careful with those things. And like, <sighs> I thought I was doing good when I would remember to clean it and put the little drops in. And then I was like, doo -doo -doo -doo, rewind, doo -doo -doo, fast forward, play for, back for. Uh, I never put the film things together. That was fun. That used to be fun because I used to go get the little projector and I put it. And I was like, I got to leave the classroom. I got. Yeah, to I think. <laughs> I think in terms of nostalgia, I think film sounds really nice and fun, but it's so much work. So much work. So yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to know that you're a DVD girl. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we have come to the end. Um, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, Miko. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>
go ahead and tell the viewers where they can find you or your work online. Okay. Uh, eventually, Right Heart Publishing will be it, but uh, most of it, but you can find me at mikomarsh.com for nonfiction and children's. Also on IG underscore Miko Moments, Facebook Miko Moments. You can write me at info at mikomarsh.com. If you're looking for the poetry and fiction, it's Obilia Akanke, O B as in boy, E L I A A K A N as in Nancy, K E dot com. And that's also Obilia Akanke on Facebook, Obilia underscore Akanke on Instagram, and info at truelifepoet.com. Very nice. Well, thank you. All right, everybody, be sure to stick around for the credits. I always have something fun in there. To my Patreon supporters, be on the lookout for some exclusive content that Miko has just for you. So until next time, stay safe, be blessed, and have fun reading. 10 plus 5 reasons to read. Studies have shown that it boosts your brain power, increases your vocabulary, is improving memory. Reading is good for gaining inspiration and motivation. Being an avid or regular reader will make you a better communicator. It also enhances imagination and spreads ideas. All right, so reading reduces stress, improving sleep. Reading can make you more empathetic because it allows you to have that experience of walking in someone else's shoes. And number 10, it's just good old entertainment. So for every good movie or TV show out there, there's at least a hundred books about the exact same thing. So five more reasons why Carney loves books and why maybe you should consider reading. So number one is variety of platforms and genres. And then there's the variety in medium. And then there's social engagement. Now, we, we, most of us can agree that reading is a solitary activity. It's you and a book and you're reading but you can use books as social engagement. There are book clubs that you can join. There's all kinds of online things. You can indulge or enhance your interest. Again, like I said, if you wanna read a book about underwater basket weaving, you can do that. So being a reader does make you a member of a very exclusive population who reads when other people don't. So that's my presentation on five, 10 plus five reasons to read. Um, if you're interested in my sources, I came up with all of the options on my own, but then I went online and found a couple of articles that kind of backed up my research because I thought I was just making this stuff up, but apparently other people agree with me. So here are three articles.